Good evening. Wow, that is loud. Call it the voice of God. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeremy Vanetta. I'm the uh, chair of the Billings Chamber of Commerce's Board of Directors, which is a proud partner uh, to the Mansfield Center for tonight's event. I'd like to be the first to welcome you all to this evening. We're so grateful all of you are here. Uh, we want to take a moment to give a special thanks to Norma and Gary Buchanan and Buchanan Capital. I know, Gary, if you can please stand up. I know you're back there. Oh, come on, Gary. You got to stand up. We got to see you back there. Thank you for underwriting and, and making this event happen. We appreciate that very much. Uh, well, if you're here tonight, you probably have the feeling that something might feel a little off in our society, be it in our city, state, or the county. We seem more divided than ever. We know our politics sure are. America's unity seems strained by deep ideological fault lines. And while the nation has always been woven with threads of differing convictions, today's political polarization seems to be at an all-time high. And it's not just politics, it's healthcare, where folks argue about access and affordability, leaving the middle ground feeling like a no man's land. Climate change, well, that's a whole other battlefield with one side rallying for urgent action and the other waving off concerns. Even basic facts seem up for grabs with different camps clinging to their own versions of reality. Social media just pours fuel on the fire and doesn't seem to create room for much conversation. Hell, we can't even agree if Travis Kelsey put Taylor Swift on the map or if Taylor Swift put Travis Kelsey on the map. I know some of you probably don't get that reference. We'll go Grizz and Cap. Who's going to win this weekend? We can't. We can't agree on that. We'll have to, <laughs> right? See, here we go. Here we go. We'll have to ask our distinguished panel which, what their opinions are on those matters. But either way, tonight's discussion should be an interesting one in understanding how we bring civility and discourse back to America and even our own local political system. And I now get the opportunity to welcome Dina Mansour. Dina is the Executive Director of the Marine and Mike Mansfield Center at the University of Montana. A former diplomat, her parents' immigration to the U.S. informs her commitment to American democracy and her work to bridge divides as she supports the people of Montana and the nation. Under her leadership, the Mansfield Center has successfully competed for nearly $40 million in federal grant funding over the last 14 years to implement programs in democracy and international engagement. Please help me welcome Dina Mansour. Thank you. It is an incredible honor for me to be here in Billings. This is the first Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center event in Billings. Um, so exciting for us. Thank you for coming out. So I have to take a picture of this because I have to get a picture of all of you. So just give me a second here. <laughs> all right, ready? Um, so it's also my honor to be the director of the Mansfield Center. We were founded by an act of Congress in 1983. This is our 40th anniversary year. And we were founded to honor the legacy of Mike Mansfield as informed by his wife, Maureen, that his, con um, his uh, fellow uh, Congress members wanted to honor his tenure as longest serving Senate Majority Leader, during which he navigated incredibly turbulent times, the <clears throat> Vietnam War, Watergate, assassinations, um, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, um, and he did all of this with an air of integrity, bipartisanship, um, ethics, and that's what we need in this country today, and that's why here, we're here in um, Billings today, because we see the passion that you have for your community. <laughs> We see the passion you have for your community, um, and that's been informed by Norma and Gary Buchanan. It's been an incredible honor for us that they've invited the Mansfield Center in. They've supported us, they've introduced us to all of you and their friends and neighbors. Um, so I wanna echo Jeremy's thanks to Gary and Norma for making this night possible.
Mike Mansfield truly belonged to the entire state. A lot of you know the Mansfield story. A lot of you have your own Mansfield story. Um, he grew up a juvenile delinquent in Great Falls. He ran away from home a number of times. He lived in a juvenile delinquent home. He lied about his age when he was 14 to join the military. Uh, he served in three branches of the military, and then he returned to Montana to work in the Butte Copper Mines. And it was Maureen that changed his life, that inspired him to come to the University of Montana. That changed his life. He was a student, he was a professor, and then he went on uh, to be, again, our longest serving Senate Majority Leader and our longest serving U.S. Ambassador to Japan. So here we are to represent that incredible legacy, um, and we are so honored to have two tremendous gentlemen that are um, really living that Mansfield legacy. Hopefully each of you picked up a program on the way in. Um, if you did not, grab one on the way out. Their full bios are here. We also have a sign-up sheet. I know a lot of you have already joined the Mansfield Dialogues virtually. If you're interested in learning more, please give us your name and email address. And also I want to point out that there, um, there are books out for sale. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, the bookseller will be there after the program. Um, so I'm not going to repeat the bios that we have here other than to say we have two incredible men that are joining us on the stage that live the Mansfield way, that their careers have been defined by integrity, by com uh, care for country over party, uh, for commitment to our democracy, and that's why they're here today. Um, Mark Johnson has written three books on the Senate. The most recent is on Mansfield and Dirksen, and he'll be talking a bit about how that bipartisanship was um, something incredible for our country and something we could see again today. Former Governor Mark Roscoe, so many of you are here because of him, that you know him, you love him, you care very much about what he did to define the state. Um, so I want uh, to ask you all to help me welcome them up to the stage. This is a bipartisan entry. You remember to turn your mic on, Governor? Hey, it's already <laughs> done. Thank you. Oh. What a great opportunity to uh, be with one of my favorite people, uh, to be associated with the Mansfield Center at the University of Montana and to be back in Billings to talk to uh, such a great crowd uh, about the guy that I feel like I've been living with for the last three or four years, Mike Mansfield. Many things uh, struck me about the Mansfield story as I was researching it in his archive at uh, the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Library in Missoula. By the way, an absolutely incredible historical resource maybe not known to many people. Uh, Mansfield was a history professor, so he literally kept everything. Uh, the files and the uh, archive of his service in the House and later in the Senate, and then as ambassador, is a phenomenal resource and will be for years and years to come for historians. Um, so one of the things that struck me in r writing the Mansfield story in the 1960s was a quote from uh, a journalist that some of you will remember, David Broder, who for about 50 years or so was considered kind of the creme de la creme of American political journalists, a columnist and a reporter for the Washington Post who covered every president from Dwight Eisenhower to Barack Obama. And he said that Mike Mansfield was the greatest American he'd ever met. Uh, when late in his life, Mansfield had uh, lunch with Dave Broder, and Broder, the lead on Dave Broder's column about that event was, I just had lunch with the most impressive American I've ever met. Quite a testament to uh, this one-time copper miner from Butte, Montana. So what was it about Mansfield that made for that greatness, and what makes it so worthwhile for us to consider his legacy in our somewhat troubled times. Well, uh, you could say, for starters, the record is really incredible, unmatched maybe in the 20th century. 
uh, the architect of the strategy in the Senate to pass the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, to create Medicare, uh, to pass the Wilderness Act, to create for the first time really uh, federal support for secondary and higher education. Um, the Peace Corps, the first uh, nuclear test ban treaty that served as the foundation for every subsequent mm -hmm. nuclear arms control effort, uh, which happened during the Kennedy administration. So I could go on and on, you know, it creates the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. We wouldn't have public television without uh, this legislative accomplishment in the 1960s. All of it happened while Mansfield was the majority leader in the Senate. And it was striking for me to realize that during that period, every single one of those pieces of legislation which still affect our lives today was passed with a bipartisan majority. So you could talk about Mansfield just on the basis of his um, legislative accomplishment. But I think what David Broder saw in him and what I see in him and I think what Governor Roscoe sees in the Mansfield legacy was something even more profound. Uh, the character of the man, the sense of integrity, the sense of responsibility. Uh, I like a word that the governor uses often, fidelity. Fidelity to the Constitution, to the rule of law, to the idea that partisanship shouldn't dominate our politics, but common sense should. That it's not a sin to reach across the political aisle and hear what the other side has to say, because they often have a good idea that should be implemented. And Mansfield lived that uh, code in the Senate uh, for 16 straight years as majority leader, for a total of 24 years in the Senate, and then carried that kind of ethic with him uh, to Japan, as Dina said, to become the longest serving ambassador in American history. So I could go on and on about this guy, but if you believe that history can inform our current time, then you have to look at an example like Mansfield and try to learn from him what he was able to accomplish and what he meant not only to Montana, but literally to the world. He was probably underappreciated here at home in the sense that he was an international figure, uh, literally from the time he came to the United States Senate in the early 1950s. Absolutely incredible, incredible personal story, but a story that we can learn from today, I think, as we grapple with some of the challenges <coughs> that face American democracy. And I'm gonna stop there with this uh, observation, Governor, and let you uh, pick up on why the Mansfield Center thinks this is so important to be out talking about these ideas today. I wrote a column today for, or filed a column today for a newspaper in Idaho. And I compared American democracy to the old story about the, uh, the frog that's placed in a, in a pot of uh, tepid water and doesn't immediately jump out. And as the temperature goes up in this pot on the stove, uh, the frog is too slow to react to the change and uh, the consequences are fatal. I sort of feel like we're in that position now with American democracy. We're not paying enough attention to what's going on, too many of us. We're not taking seriously the threat to uh, democratic institutions uh, like the courts and uh, the, you know, the investigative branches of our government. Uh, we're trivializing uh, too much of uh, the congressional process. And um, we need to pay more attention. And I think what the Mansfield Center is trying to do is say, we have a platform and a variety of different ways to cause more engagement among citizens and to cause us to be more aware of the threats that are always inherent to a democracy that seem to be particularly relevant uh, right now. So I want to say how honored I am to have made appearances across Montana the last few months with Governor Roscoe and how uh, impressed I am with his take on the current situation and what we can do as individuals to address it. And it's a real uh, distinct honor for me to be with you again tonight, Governor. Thank you, Marcus. Um
two marks against you this evening. Um, we're delighted to be here and to be talking about what we're talking about. I want to thank, uh, too, as well, my um, friends um, Gary and Norma Buchanan for their generosity, their insight, and their investment in our efforts at the uh, Mansfield Center. Gary and I have shared a 50-year-long friendship, and he has been a counselor and advisor, sometimes a director, to me over a long course of time. And we're grateful for you. I don't see you precisely, Gary. There you are. There they are, right back there, once again, avoiding any kind of um, attention. But thank you, genuinely. We greatly appreciate it. And thank all of you for being here tonight. I do look out across um, the many faces in uh, the audience, and I can see a great many people, and I've had the uh, great blessing of having the chance to renew some friendships this evening, and I'm grateful you're here and a part of this conversation. Mike Mansfield was essentially the personification of our Constitution. And when you take a look at how that uh, came about, when you trace the history, I'll try to do it in very brief terms, but nonetheless, it's important to realize that in the beginning, and it's been 2,500 years since we began this um, effort, this human race that we're a part of, trying to configure a government <clears throat> or a governmental form that would allow for the creativity and the capacity for freedom that individuals uh, that are born on this planet have an inherent ability to be able to put into practice to govern themselves. We tried everything as a human race for about um, 1,500, 1,600 years. Uh, oligarchies, tyrannies of every sort and kind, despots to ruling, monarchies, theocracies, and none of them ultimately ended up enduring because they did not engage the people over which they had application. It just so happened that in the Age of Enlightenment, after the printing press had been developed, and these discussions had been ongoing, even though there were some rudimentary beginnings with the Greeks and our ancient um, Romans with experimentation with democratic forms of government, it really didn't get to be a serious effort to design until the middle 1700s. And that discussion began in Europe and ultimately infected the minds and wills of those who gathered in the hall in Philadelphia to put together a constitution for the people of this country after having declared themselves free just um, two years before. Well, how did that happen? They realized, of course, that when it comes to a form of government, you cannot um, live by the law of the jungle. The strong prosper, the weak die. And that was never going to be satisfactory. But with the experimentation they were aware of over all those generations, they finally came to the conclusion that if you have a carefully balanced form of government, you could end up from that union created by universal subscription of the citizens of that nation that focused upon that democracy, ultimately being able to live in freedom and liberty. So that's how we came about to discuss what was discussed in Philadelphia. It was amazing what happened. It was a miracle of sorts a number of different lessons that you could glean from what happened in Philadelphia. One was people came to that um, convocation with a great deal of diversity and a lot of contrary opinion. And there was no consensus when they first began. But over the course of 89 days, sitting in the same room in a sweltering hot summer in Philadelphia, gradually they established connections with each other. Lesson number one. We don't engage each other like that anymore. And as a consequence, even all of our deliberative bodies, Congress, state legislatures, whatever it might be, we are not acting in concert with our fellow human beings as much as we used to. So the social capital that comes from that interaction is not present and accounted for and holding us together, all equally invested in what it is that we're doing as a nation and as a people. Secondly, there was exclusive focus in that meeting hall upon what was occurring inside that meeting hall. There were no distractions. You had one opportunity to speak, and you could not speak again until such time as everyone else had a chance to offer their thoughts 
and intuitions. Lesson number two, never draw a conclusion until you come to the point to where you ultimately have considered all of the evidence. Number three, also visible at that moment in time, you have to respect those who are offering opinions and advancing ideas into the public marketplace because you expect your ideas to be appreciated as well. So after all of those days and all of those arguments, and they were there, by the way, only to amend the Articles of Confederation, which was really kind of a, a handshake about remaining committed to one another, but with no provision for any kind of governmental form or shape or any powers that would be shared by the individual states, any central government authority, all of that had never been discussed before in serious terms by an authorized body. But when they came out of those deliberations, what happened? After those 89 days together, I think the convention actually lasted 117 days, but at the end, <clears throat> they submitted it for ratification by the states. And that occurred after 180 years of waiting from the landing on the shores of Virginia until that constitution was passed by the framers after waiting all of that time, it took only 10 months for the people of this country to ultimately ratify the Constitution. It, it was a miraculous occurrence. And it was the result of people engaging people following normal rules and values and adhering to respect and confidence in each other and ultimately coming to trust one another. Now, fast forward to 1972. The very same thing happened here in the state of Montana. We decided as a people to go forward with the drafting of a new constitution in 1972. They gathered, they were elected, all of those delegates, none of them presently existing office holders. They could, they could disclose their political predilections if they chose. Some were Democrats, some were Republicans, some were independents. My recollection is 56 Democrats, 38 Republicans, six independents. The first thing they did when they reported for duty, none of them could be elected officials, by the way, and as a consequence, when they reported on their first day of duty in the state capitol, they decided that instead of seating themselves next to only those who were members of their party, that they would seat themselves alphabetically. And secondly, they decided that they would share power. In other words, just because the Democrats held the majority by some substantial margin, did not preclude Republicans from chairing committees. So the committees were equally shared in spite of the numbers by Democrats and Republicans. At the end, a very vigorous debate over a period of time, which involved the citizens of Montana being invited to submit ideas for the formation of our foundational document, that the contract that we have with each other and with our government, they ultimately drew conclusions about 56 days later is my memory, and submitted them to the people of the state of Montana. They unanimously signed the document, and it was thereafter approved by the people of Montana. What are the lessons from that convention? I would say that they're the same ones that I mentioned before, plus the, the ability to trust each other to the point to where you would share equal power from beginning to end, that you would involve your fellow citizens who, after all, own this government, and involve them in the crafting and the presentation of the document and the concepts in it. So these are the lessons I think that we can take from both of these conventions. They're also, I think, the guideposts that guided Mike Mansfield's life. Whether he was born just intuitively inclined toward the, the values that we see embedded in the Constitution, whether he learned them over a course of time, whether they were just reflections of his character. It's difficult to say, it, but at the end of the day, the most important thing was he lived those values every single day. He trusted the people that he lived with, and he trusted those that he worked with. As a consequence, he was never on guard. He was totally open and transparent. And that way of approaching business, he also, I think, reflected an unbelievable amount of humility. He never came into a room thinking he knew everything and that nobody else knew anything. 
And as a consequence of engagement and honest brokerage and being involved with people on a very personal and human level, never forgetting us the entire time that he served in Congress or when he was ambassador to Japan, he ultimately, at the end of the day, I think, I think um, becomes the most admired uh, a public official in the history of the state of Montana and one of the most important figures in the history of this country. So what do we have to risk here? When you think about it, a constitution, a democracy, is a contract between each of us with each other. And it also is embedded with values that we believe in. And that was by design. The framers infused the values that we believe are important to a civilized society into the document. The document depends for its life upon those values being preserved and ultimately being observed at the same moment in time. So those values that Mansfield lived are the same values that are in that document. And they require sacrifice and careful uh, caretaking of one another as citizens and remembering our promise that we make remembering that not every idea that we have is necessarily embraced by every other member of our civil society, that the ideas of all are entitled to respect, that the presentation and argument is ultimately designed to benefit the public good. So if a, an idea happens to coincide, a good idea, coincide with a political platform, what a happy doesn't, if it doesn't, what, what imperative? And at the end of the day, it is the Constitution that takes precedence. It is our values that take precedence. And so if you have to choose between your party and your state or your, uh, your nation or each other, you have to take party for, uh, last and all of those other choices first. So that's, that's the hierarchy of values that we have forgotten. How delicate is this Constitution? It's, it's incredibly delicate. If you think about, I, I, would, I would be surprised if I asked you, how many here feel like things just aren't right? How many would raise your hand? See, we're an optimistic creature. We, we're, we're born optimistic. The Constitution is optimistic. It believes in the best of humankind, but it expects the best of humankind, including discipline and commitment to one another and unselfishness and trust in the ultimate providence of this country in order for it to long endure. So the moment we start mistrusting, the moment when we insist on only our thoughts being considered, the moment that we move forward regardless of any other offers of insight or provision of policy and ignore those that we live with or we quit taking care of each other. That's the day the democracy starts to fall apart. And it is delicate, it's very delicate because it depends upon our consent for its life and survival. So what can we do? Well, all of you who are here tonight seems to me like a pretty good beginning. And the Mansfield Center is perfectly designed. How prophetic it was, even though we don't face, didn't face the same emergency 40 years ago when the Mansfield Center was created, it nonetheless was prophetic that it was created because in this day and age, providing the opportunity for a careful study, examination, and policy development center that focuses upon the best interests of the country modeled after a, an extraordinary human being, we're in a position to be effective in terms of bringing about a restoration, a rediscovery, and a recommitment to our values and to our democracy so that it can possibly long endure. So you being here tonight is a very, very good thing as far as I can see. And there are a number of ways we think that we can deal with these issues of today. One of them is through education, which unfortunately has been uh, slightly um, ignorant of what is going on in terms of providing uh, educational opportunity for our young people, uh, for our older people who used to be young people, for all of us to remember just how gifted we have been, how blessed we have been 
to live in the United States of America. So thanks for being here. And um, our great hope is that we all leave with a commitment in any way that feels comfortable or possible to enliven the life of this country through the preservation of our Constitution and the modeling of the conduct of Mike Mansfield. Governor. I'll tell one quick Mansfield story that I think uh, exemplifies what you've just said about listening carefully, uh, having respect for a different point of view, and uh, being willing to share responsibility and power. Uh, two great uh, legislative triumphs of the 1960s, passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and then immediately the next year, passage of the Voting Rights Act. Hard for me to believe that this many years later, the Voting Rights Act is in the headlines again, uh, somewhat controversial in some parts of our society. But nonetheless, Mansfield considered the Voting Rights Act the greatest legislative accomplishment of the 1960s. So set the context real quickly. What happened to spur the Congressional action on the Voting Rights Act? The march, the attempted march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama by Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which resulted at least initially in uh, Alabama state troopers uh, setting upon the crowd, peaceful demonstrators, pe peaceful marchers, marching simply for the right to vote the right to be able to register to vote and cast a ballot. And John Lewis, later the very prominent and very distinguished congressman from Georgia, was beaten at the Pettus Bridge outside of Selma's, Selma uh, to the point where he had to be hospitalized. So that's the context of what's going on in the country. So Mansfield knows that the Senate and the Congress and the president have to act on a voting rights measure early in 1965 in the wake of what had happened in Selma. And he knows he needs to get Republican votes in order to get anything done in the Senate because of this quirky rule about unlimited debate. You have to have a supermajority to cut off debate. And he's going to have to work across the aisle with his counterpart, Everett Dirksen. So he basically completely cedes legislative leadership in the Senate to Dirksen for the second time on this major issue. Did the same thing on the Civil Rights Act the year before. But he basically says to Dirksen, you call the shots on this. Uh, we're going to follow your lead. We need you to bring along enough Republican votes to offset the Southern segregationists that we'll lose in my own party. Selling all the shots. Dirksen's on television every night. Dirksen's quoted in the third paragraph of every story about the Voting Rights Act. And he's, uh, the aide says to Mansfield, couldn't we just once in a while have one of the meetings in the majority leader's office instead of in Dirksen's office? Mansfield, you can just see him puffing on that pipe, Roscoe-like. <laughs> <laughs> I deny it. <laughs> Mansfield says to his aide, no, we're not going to do that. He said, you know, it's really, really important that the American public see the Republican leader of the Senate talking about the importance of the Voting Rights Act. That is overriding important, that is of overriding importance to the American people, that they see that Republicans are supporting this effort. So we're going to keep doing it just the way we do. We, we have been doing it. All the meetings were held in Dirksen's office. He was uh, the guy that got the attention and deserves a tremendous amount of credit for it. Mansfield deserves a tremendous amount of credit for realizing that that had to happen in order to create that historic piece of legislation. Talk about leadership. Talk about courage. Talk about fidelity to the institution of the Senate and the Constitution. Uh, the personification of that uh, in the senator from Montana. Mark, um, my memory is that the Voting Rights Pact passed with an excess of 70 votes is um, it did big. Indeed. Yep. So, remarkable. Could we expect um, such things at this very moment 
Well, it's tough to get 60 votes to even uh, bring to the floor uh, nomination of a four-star general to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah. Um, can you, you know, part of your book that really I found charming was the relationship between Mansfield and Dirksen, how different personalities, one almost an actor, the other one... Um, he was an actor. He was an actor. <laughs> um, would you describe that a little bit about... Um, I mean, it seemed at the end of the day they genuinely loved each other. You know, uh, I think of them almost as the yin and yang of American politics. Uh, Dirksen was a, aspired to be an actor as a young man. He wrote over a hundred plays, none of which were published. <laughs> there was a point in my life when I could identify with that. Uh, he acted in plays. His mother had to talk him out of uh, his aspiration to be a professional actor, thinking that there was no possible economic security in that kind of a life. So he, but he uh, cultivated a, per a certain style uh, in his dress, that unruly mop of uh, white hair, dangling the whole thing. Uh, it was a performance in a way, and it was extremely effect effective. Plus, he was a great orator time when we appreciated oratory uh, and the ability to quote Shakespeare and work in a, to Romeo and Juliet and uh, Victor Hugo and all these kinds of references that Dirksen was so famous for. Well, man's the absolute uh, a politician who does not seek the limelight. There are you can look in vain for a picture that includes Mike Mansfield at the signing ceremonies for either the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. You've got Hubert Humphrey and Robert Kennedy and uh, Martin Luther King in these pictures, Dirksen, of course, in the picture. You'll never see Mansfield in those pictures. He, con he consciously avoided that kind of publicity. So the yin and yang, but somehow through their uh, shared respect for each other, their shared affection for the Senate as an institution, and what I think became a, uh, ultimately became a genuine friendship between the two of them, uh, they developed the absolute critical uh, essence of American politics, which is the, uh, the idea that you have to be able uh, to work with somebody on the basis of knowing that they're going to be honest with you that they're going to respect tra tradition, that they're not going to try to pull a fast one if they get an opportunity to do so. So yeah, they had a genuine uh, a friendship that transcended the transactional nature of politics. It's always part of politics. M many, many examples of I saw a picture today at the hospital where we had lunch uh, in the Mansfield room there that I had never seen before. It's Mansfield in his office at Goldman Sachs after he's come back from Washington D or from Tokyo and is back in Washington DC as an advisor to Goldman Sachs. And it's a picture of him lounging at his desk, leaning back. What's on the desk right in front of him? It's an album cover of one of Dirksen's spoken word records from the nineteen sixties. So that picture had to be taken in the, you know, the eighties or the nineties. And he still has that album cover of this kind of ho hokey record that Dirks had made 20 some years earlier. So I know you don't keep those kinds of things unless you have some deep it means uh, fighting, yeah. uh, in interest and in, in affection for someone. Well, you're the boss. We <laughs> I think it would be impossible to do it. So I think most of us in this room can agree that we would like our elected representatives to be more like Mr. Mansfield, but I also believe that we, in a democracy, get the elected representatives that we vote for and the ones that we deserve. So how do we persuade our fellow voters that bipartisanship, adherence to the Constitution and civility are things that they should value over their pet issue, whether it's guns or abortion or what have you? 
Why don't you take that softball? <laughs> Spoken by a good chief of staff right there. <clears throat> well, some of my response will probably sound a bit mundane or perhaps um, less than moving. But it involves all of us being engaged. And so there are a number of things we can do as individual voters or citizens. You can write, which I have tried to engage in, although I'm very slow at it, and um, have tried to keep up by offering thoughts and commentary to my fellow citizens. Um, unfortunately, and parenthetically, and I'll try not to make this too long, but our world of journalism um, has changed dramatically as well, but for the Daily Montanan. Um, and that is the result of all of this internet effort that, and expenditure that's been made, and all of us becoming addicted to the screens that we have, and the failure to pay attention to real journalism, thus depreciating its value, thus ultimately ending up with it disappearing, but for um, the Daily Montana. And, and as a consequence of that, um, we're not as well informed. But it is still, the papers are still a uh, great vehicle for the expression of thought and urging and, and frankly, you know, as a, as a precondition, if you're going to get engaged, you've got to have the courage to take a position and to, and to voice your concerns and to express them. And it doesn't mean it has to be nasty uh, or in some way embarrassing. It just needs to be plain and truthful. and. Um, to avoid rhetorical excess and accusation that may not be true, and if it is, then it's part of the um, then it's part of the story. But those weekly newspapers across the state of Montana, I have found, and even um, the commercial newspapers that now are part of parts of big chains that we didn't used to have in the state of Montana, um, they still take letters to the editor. So you have virtual universal coverage with local newspapers at least once a week. Not all of them take editorials, but a lot of them do. So you can express your opinions there, your urgings, um, your requests, um, your, your pep talks um, to those who work for you. That's one place. Secondly, you can do what we're doing tonight. There's nothing to prohibit any of us uh, from organizing another gathering, another opportunity to uh, have a report card on how we've done, what we've done, why we've done it. Are we making any difference? Um, I think, you know, frankly, when you look at the uh, polling information, and my own experience over the last two years traveling virtually all over Montana, is that 65% of the people in the state of Montana share the same opinion that everyone who raised their hand here tonight also holds. There's a huge majority of people in this country and in this state that are incredibly decent and thoughtful and careful. Um, they may not be overly demonstrative in their oratory or their willingness to share their own private thoughts, which is kind of, if you think about it, a characteristic of our existence in Montana. So it may take some urging or some soliciting uh, to get them engaged and to honestly express themselves. But at the end of the day, I think that they're looking for comrades and the people that they can trust and people who believe in the things that they believe in, all of which I think you would universally believe in. So newspapers, organizing events, um, whenever, whenever you can possibly do that, visiting uh, or communicating with those who work for you in public office. It doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be nasty at all. Um, it just can be straightforward and plain but moving and persuasive based upon your careful recitation of the facts and circumstances that you have concern about. Um, and then you can vote. And you can do other things, too, even though that's not a part of the discussion tonight. But there are policy provisions out there, policy proposals, that I think offer a great deal of opportunity for reform. For instance, there's one of them that provides for open primaries. And if you think about it, we have presently about 28% of the voting public that votes in a primary. 28% of the voters in this state are determining who it is that you can ultimately vote for if you don't vote in the primary. So we always have had a high 
companies, in excess of 70% typically on average, but only 28% are determining how those 70% of the population can ultimately vote. So I've always hated that, to be honest. You know, why shouldn't I be able to vote whoever I want for? Uh, to, for? And, and to be honest with you, I've never voted a straight general election ticket in my life. And I don't intend to, because I want to vote for people that have some substance and some character and some willingness to listen and work with other people and to recognize the Constitution is built on moderation and self-restraint and discipline. All of those things that Mark just desired, described about Mike Mansfield. So there are things we can do. And visitations to offices, even in groups, perhaps you might have a question for a representative or another. When Dina starts walking up the side over there, I know it's time for me to um, <laughs> move, <coughs> move back. But there are a huge number of things that we can do. We may not get everything won every day, but I would defy you to present to me a husband and wife that get everything they want every day in their household, happily married uh, men and women. We just don't, life's not like that. So why would anybody expect you get your way every day in the legislature? I mean, that's absurd. And so, anyway, there are things we can do. Let's get together and we'll um, figure them out. Just real quickly, I had three uh, elaborations on everything the governor said, which I agree with. And my wife often tells me when I get into a little rant about how things are going to hell in a handbasket, she will say to me quietly, circle of influence, circle of influence, which is a signal that we all have a circle of influence. Our friends, our family, uh, our kids, uh, start there. Start with uh, modeling the kind of civility that we all say we want in those engagements with family and friends and your circle of influence. Secondly, I'd say uh, encourage young people to pay more attention and to get more engaged. And there's a variety of ways to do that. I mean, you can uh, you know, talk to your own kids, your grandkids, uh, encourage them to uh, follow politics, to be engaged in voting, to understand what's at stake. Not just what, uh, who's running against whom, but what the stakes are for making a, an electoral decision. And then uh, the third thing I would say is encourage good people to seek public office. And without regard to partisanship, uh, we need good people to run for city council and school boards and the legislature and the highway districts and all of those places where the rubber meets the road in terms of good people doing good things that make a representative democracy function. So each of us, in addition to the, all the things that I, Governor correctly said, we have a circle of influence that we can work on, and over time, that circle of influence will expand. That's the way political campaigns and political messaging work. You start out with a, with a group of people, and then you increase the concentric circles going out from that, and you spread the message. And that's, that's where we are right now. And I would, well, I would just say, too, uh, don't kid yourselves. There's no, there's no magic wand here. There's no one to swoop in and fix this for us. It's up to us. It's up to us to become engaged to a greater degree than many of us have been, uh, to pay more attention to elections, to pay more attention to what people in public office are doing, and when you have an opportunity, vote for the best person without regard to the politics involved. And uh, that, that will go a long way to righting our ship, uh, which is tilting a little bit right now. I've noticed, uh, it, 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 because I've been in the legislature, that we really have a divide between cities and smaller uh, towns and villages in Montana. And I think that's part of the difficulty to get together on ideas. There's a lot of argument about uh, what, what they need in rural communities and many people who come to the legislature come from those small communities. 
and they're not interested in what goes on in the city, or it doesn't seem they are interested. There's, there, do you have any ideas about how we can uh, do things for each other? It's important, I think, to get that kind of, uh, it's like almost an argument. Did you hear the question? Uh, well, I think I, I think I got the gist of the question. How can we, if I can summarize or maybe simplify to the point of distortion, how do we address the rural-urban divide, get uh, folks in urban areas to understand better what's happening in rural Montana, for example, and vice versa? Uh, one thing I would say, and this is more on res the responsibility of urban legislators and urban people who represent urban areas, in the Democratic Party, and I'm a Democrat, I'll say that uh, with some proudness, the Democratic Party has made a significant mistake, generally speaking, in the Rocky Mountain West by failing to show up in rural America to listen carefully to what's happening with the economy, with what happens to the resource economy in those communities, uh, what's happening in terms of trade issues and all kinds of things. I don't want to get on a political... So 90% of life, as Woody Allen said, is just showing up. And we have to be more uh, willing, I think, to put down those rural-urban boundaries, to show up to listen to what the concerns in a place that live and maybe don't understand it. I'd say the same thing on the flip side, that uh, listen more carefully to the challenges that urban America right now. But it's it starts with listening and it starts with showing up and caring about what I would agree yeah, um, completely. But also, Kathy, offer you a couple of anecdotal um, pieces of information that I think at the end of the day suggest that we're capable of communicating with virtually anybody if we invest the right amount of time and effort and information that we know to be correct and share it with one another. And let me give you a couple of examples. I was, um, I had kind of an interesting um, series of events during the last legislative session. And um, I was out, of course, um, probably talking, uh, which I mostly do most of the time. And, um, and I got in some uh, difficulty with um, the party that I've normally been associated with for a long period of time and ultimately got I guess that one could say invited um, to leave. And um, so as a consequence of that, I, you know, I really had, in 2016, when I realized who was going to be a candidate from my party, that I had serious qualms and questions about the capacity and character of that particular candidate. And I made that known, which started this entire process. But on that on that day, I can remember, is the day I crossed the Rubicon. And I established a, a hierarchy of values for me that I was comfortable with, and that was nation and state came first, politics came second, party came second. So it wasn't a surprise to me, and I, I frankly don't really have a response to it. It's fine, do whatever you need to do, because I think there are more transcendent issues that we have to address. So. It was because of that, I go into that diatribe uh, to explain that, because I was invited by the Sanders County Democratic Central Committee to come to a meeting in Plains, Montana. And for all of you that um, have been, uh, spent a lot of time in the West, um, you know that's a very small community. When I was a kid, I was born in that county. When I was a kid growing up, and Mike Mansfield used to visit us in our county right next door, Lincoln County. Um, and my father used to campaign for him. And I think, frankly, if my mother would admit it, I grew up in a, in a mixed marriage. One was a Democrat and one was a Republican. No wonder I'm confused at the end of the day. <laughs> and so I was invited to come up for the meeting because they wanted to talk about the Constitution and democracy. They said, if you want to come up early, that would be fine. Um, we're going to have our central committee meeting, and then we're going to get on with the discussion about the Constitution. So I went up. I, you know, I love Sanders County. 
I'm one of the few people on the planet that knows it's the longest county in the state of Montana. Um, and I arrived in time for the meeting. They had their meeting. I listened to all their discussions and their strategies, and they were open and collaborative. And then people started showing up with potluck. And I realized that this was going to be a, a picnic. Everybody in the community had been invited. By the time the afternoon was over, there were Democrats and Republicans in the room. We were talking about the Constitution in small groups and large groups. Potluck was being served, and there must have been, I would guess, 100 people there on a Sunday afternoon in Plains, Montana. So I thought probably an anomaly, an exception to the rule. About a month later, I got an invitation from Paradise, and I don't know if you all know where Paradise is, but um, you know what Paradise should be like, I would suspect, but you don't <laughs> know where Paradise is. It's about six miles further east of Plains in Sanders County, and this was on a Sunday afternoon. Nobody lives there anymore except for a few people, and they have an old school that's no longer used but turned into a community center. And they wanted to know if we would come up and talk with them about the Constitution. So um, Dan Chemist and myself and uh, one of the delegates to the Constitution came up on a Sunday afternoon, not really understanding what we might expect. There were 150 people there on a Sunday afternoon. And the same thing happened in Flathead County. And the same thing happened in Carbon County. And there's room out there for us. All of you, as ambassadors, if you believe in what it is that we're confronting and that it's urgent, there's room for us to fit into these discussions. And there's interest uh, to be taken advantage of. So everything from individual activity to group activity um, and visitations um, to our representatives with, with a, a suggestion, um, at least some message about what we expect from them in terms of their performance and their it does change things. As Mark said, it's going to take a while. It took us a while to get But the alternative really stinks. My question is, uh, I'm a freshman legislator. Uh, I actually was a co-sponsor of the seating chart for the alphabetical this year. I came to the legislature, I'd never been political in my life, but I was tired of people um, being nasty to each other, so that's why I ran. When I got there, I recognized that as a member of the supermajority that uh, I was really mostly interested in civility. We went to the Mansfield Center with the sausage making. Um, I was able to pass quite a few bills that um, uh, were bipartisan. And I found that there were a lot fewer people that were entrenched than I expected. I found that there was a great swath of people that I could work with back and forth across the aisle. I, I mean, it was even ironic to see the alt-right and the alt-left get together to work together, but that's another story. Uh, the question that I have for you, do you see things getting better. I, I mean, what I saw, I was very hopeful, and it makes me want to return. Is that Representative Green? I called yeah. you, as you know, more than once, left you several messages. You're one of my heroes, you know that? Um, <laughs> because you did the right thing for the right reason. We've, we've never met, um, but it was a courageous thing to do, and it was ridiculed. There were jokes made about it. At the end of the day, you know how important being in each other's company is because we communicate so much non-verbally. We're social creatures. And to wall ourselves off, to me, is just nothing more than inane drivel. At the end of the day, it does nothing but separate us. So I very much appreciate your courage in doing that and you're trying to advocate for that as well as your efforts toward bipartisanship. And I will tell you too plainly, I will confirm what you said that, in fact, there's not as much distance, unless you presume it, uh, as it, some people think there is. I have had numerous conversations with Democrats and Republicans individually 
over the last um, year, at least since the um, legislature adjourned, and I found the same thing to be true that you have stated here tonight, and that is there's not that much distance that we can't get back on the same track. So thank you for what you did. We seem to have one, uh, we seem to have politicians now that want to control all three branches of government and the free press. My question for you, which I don't understand, why don't people realize how dangerous that is and uh, where that could lead? You know I mean? <clears throat> well, I'll try to answer that. I think part of the answer is uh, we have gotten away from understanding a principle that uh, the governor alluded to earlier that's baked into our system, which is a separation of powers between the branches of government and an independent, uh, vigilant <coughs> press that uh, holds all of government accountable and should hold all of government accountable, as uncomfortable as it can be for some politicians at certain times. But it's, it's absolutely the wisdom of the uh, U.S. Constitution that uh, those gentlemen gathered in Philadelphia that the governor was referring to earlier created that system where you have three branches of government that provide checks and balances against the other branches. Uh, it's, it's the handiwork of the Lord. It's beautiful. And to, to deviate from it or to denigrate it or to advance one branch of government over another uh, is to do violence to the fidelity that politicians swear to uphold that Constitution. That is, the f that is a fundamental aspect of American government, separation of powers. So we've gotten away from the notion that people, uh, number one, respect that, honor that, uh, and believe that it's important. So we've got to restore that, and we have to think uh, more deeply and talk more profoundly about how we uh, we, we live in a cherished system that uh, can only function if people respect the norms that have governed that system for uh, more than 200 years. When we deviate from the norms, as we did in the 1850s, the 1860s, catastrophic things happen. They really do. And we, we can't allow that to happen in our time. I totally um, agree with the, the encroachment issues that are facing the judiciary. You know, when you think about it, the judiciary in some ways is our weakest branch of government. They have neither the power of the sword nor um, the uh, power to tax. And they don't choose the cases that they get to settle. They are presented to them. They come to them by force of the process, not by their choice or selection. And in addition to that, they are expected and charged with, they swear to uphold the law and to rule on the basis of uh, factual presentations and not partiality. So this really, there's, there's nothing sinister um, about this or hard to understand. Human beings, all of us, want to control as much of life as we possibly can. And so whether it's in a friendship or in a a um, bridge club or whatever it might be, we would like to set the, the table and make certain that the arrangement is to our liking and suits our taste. At the end of the day, um, the judiciary can't do that. They have to follow the law passed by the legislature and they, um, they need to be able to be in a partial, impartial position. I mean, how many of you would want a uh, tribunal that was composed of people who are motivated by political partisanship. And I think that the reverse is those who disagree with the decisions of the judiciary, and that's a healthy uh, review of whether or not they are um, thinking about carefully what it is that they do when they exercise their judicial function. But those who want to control that are making a huge mistake because they're, in essence, eviscerating uh, the judicial branch of government that has no ability to fight back and has no ability to appropriate money, and if, but does have the ability to decide difficult cases on the basis of established law. That's um, sometimes something that people want to control and it's incredibly dangerous. 
because it, that's the, it, the first thing, if that happens, the uh, Constitution and the democracy will tumble and crumble right at a, a, before our very eyes. So it's, um, I think part of the problem here is we've gotten away from, there are many in the audience, my age at least, um, and we all were subjected to a lot of educational opportunity to learn about our system of government and about our history and how hard it was to obtain and how easily it can be lost. And America has failed somewhat in providing educational opportunity, especially at a young age, all the way through high school and in college, that requires um, instruction in civility and civil discourse and our American government and how it functions and how, how delicate it is. That's another part of the problem, and that's part of what Mansfield is doing. We're designing our own programming that focuses upon the Constitution and the American history and the civil culture that Mike Mansfield manifested every single day. We're going to be providing video instruction guides. We have videos that we are in the process of preparing. The first ones will go to juniors in high school. The next one is a target audience of eighth graders all the way down to elementary school, but even our colleges and universities. Some of our university system units do not require a um, American government or a civics class in order to graduate from that particular institution. This is not unique to Montana. This happened across the country. We all got fascinated uh, by what it was that was taking place with our STEM curriculums, and they're important. I don't mean to depreciate them for a moment, and none of this was done with purpose or desire to destroy or harm. It just happened. We let it happen. And we have a sound education before we can expect people to exercise the right judgment about what we ought to do with our Constitution. We have time for one more question. Could, could I just add yes. one re real quick Mansfield anecdote that illustrates the governor's point about the separation of powers and how incred incredibly important it is, particularly with, with regard to the judicial branch, the justice branch of government. Mike Mansfield had a, uh, a enormous respect for the institution of the presidency. And he was loath to criticize presidents of either party, feeling that they alone, a president alone, had these enormous responsibilities and enormous pressure uh, for foreign affairs and all kinds of activities that most uh, politicians and most Americans couldn't possibly come to appreciate. The, the difficulty and the intensity, the pressures that go along with that job. He had respect for Richard Nixon up until the point on a Saturday night in October of 1973 when Nixon fired the Watergate special prosecutor. Mike Mansfield was completely willing to let the Watergate investigation unfold however it was going to unfold, we'll follow the, the leads wherever the truth held, but he was really offended by the executive branch's assertion of power over the independent judiciary, and in that case, a special prosecutor investigating what became the crimes of Watergate. And at that point, I think Mansfield really turned on a dime figured something really is amiss here. Uh, a president who was respecting the Constitution and had fidelity to uh, the separation of powers would not have done that. And uh, it really kind of radicalized him about uh, what happened in uh, the Watergate paper. So um, it underscores the importance of respect for the separation of those branches of our government and how they all have to function with a certain degree of independence from each other and an obvious amount of respect for each other. Governor, as elected Republican at one point in my life, I'm tired of not being able to tell people I'm a Republican. <clears throat> uh, for he whose name shall not be spoken, and those that support him, I will never vote for any of those people. But is there any salvation for the Republican Party? Because 
there were reasons that I chose to be a Republican. And I think most of those reasons have disappeared in the current marketplace. Um, what's the future of the Republican Party as you see it? Well, I think it's, it's obviously difficult to predict. Um, the extremism is not just in the Republican Party. The extremism is bipartisan. Uh, I think part of, uh, of our existence to a certain extent, there is a far left as well. But demonstrably, and having an overwhelming presence in our lives is the far right, and obviously um, guiding and directing the country as they see fit in this present moment. I don't know the solution to that, except that, um, as Representative Green indicated, I think there are a lot of Republican office holders who are more than capable of um, being persuaded and feeling comfortable in a less um, confrontational uh, arena than what they have um, been presently experiencing over the course of time. There are five influences that have intersected to provide the opportunity. I don't know if, um, if we would all agree upon them, but th there are a lot of changes that crept up on us in a lot of ways. The internet uh, makes it more brassy and angry and bitter, uh, and it's constant and uh, virtually um, present everywhere. You, you just can't escape the amount of information, and a lot of it is wrong, and, and people don't have time to catch up, and there are a lot of fearful people in the country. I think a lot of our fellow citizens are afraid of what's going on, and as a consequence, they react by trying to enact policy that they believe will forever settle the question and get it etched in stone as a final answer to all the problems that uh, society faces as they see those issues. So I, I think there are a number of different motivations, but I don't see it changing until such time as um, all of us uh, voice our expectations and guided and directed back to a, a stream of consciousness and a course of conduct that ultimately makes sense and is consistent with the expectations of our way of life. And that includes everything from the development of more social capital, um, and, and by that I mean engaging with each other, and being open to a, a changing world that's dramatically moving in different directions that we have to get used to and confront and try to, to deal with in ways that are uncomfortable to us. So. But I've, again, as, as Representative Green pointed out, I've talked to a lot of people on both sides of the aisle, and if we just had the time to get us all in the same room, and everyone would acquiesce to thinking about considering um, these discussions in a fair and thoughtful environment that was based upon facts and solid evidence, and that took into account the uh, views and expectations of other people, we would not experience the sense of distance that we experience today. So I don't know the exact formula for how we get back where. I do know that we've got to do all that we can to try and, and guide public policy that's going to be enacted until we get to that moment, if we ever do, in a way that serves the best interests of the public. In other words, the public good and not the individual interests of our, of our parties. But at the end of the day, you know, Lincoln had the same confrontation. He was a good Whig for a long time. And um, it wasn't until 1860, when there were four candidates, four different candidates for president in 1860, and he um, became the first Republican candidate, um, embraced a new philosophy that was very controversial, and at the end of the day, um, based upon the good sense and honest purpose of enough people, got elected president of the United States with 39% of the vote. Um, had more than enough electoral votes, but only 3% of the popular vote. and in our government. Is my mic working? <laughs> so I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to end there. We have gone over. Uh, it's a great time to end with Governor Roscoe. So I want to thank all of you. Ooh, <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> Um, I know time flies, right, when we're talking about democracy, but I want to thank all of you for being here, for your commitment, your care for community. Please join us in doing what we knew, need to demonstrate fidelity to our community and our country. The Mansfield Center would not be here, and this talk would not have happened without John Brewer and the Billings Chamber of Commerce, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> We are incredibly work lucky to work with them. They are phenomenal. They care about community. They are doing so much for this um, place. So we thank them. Um, thank all of you for being here. Please join us. And one more round of applause for our tremendous speakers. All right. Thank you and good night.